if I speak too fast, let me know, wave at me or throw something at me, I would appreciate it. Okay. So this is the overview of the presentation, really, in terms of the structure of the presentation. And really what I'm looking at is the sources of international human rights law that are relevant um, in relation to prohibiting um, torture or inhumane degrading treatment or punishment. So looking at the sources of law around that and looking at the architecture for the investigation and also the prevention of torture. Um, and there's a number of specialised bodies that have a mandate in that regard. I'll talk through those very briefly at the start. Um, and then looking at the challenges for those um, bodies that had that role in preventing torture or inhumane degrading treatment um, or, or punishment. And then look at, I suppose, that, you know, looking beyond the challenges then and looking at the case study which I was asked to do, which is the European context, looking at the Council of Europe, looking at particular the European um, Court of Human Rights and how they've interpreted Article 3 in cases taken by persons with disabilities alleging violation of their rights um, under Article 3, which is the right to be free from torture or inhumane degrading treatment uh, or punishment. Okay, so these are the sources of law, and there's actually quite a lot of them. And one of the, one of the things that's very, I suppose, clear is that the whole, the whole notion of human, di human dignity um, kind of comes through all of these. And actually, there's a really interesting article written by a professor uh, in Columbia, um, Professor Samuel Moyne, and he actually talked about the origins of the concept of human dignity or individual dignity and he actually traced that back to the 1937 Irish Constitution um, in a paper he entitled, Did the Irish Save Civilization? The Secret History of Constitutional Dignity. And he um, kind of suggests that the inclusion in the preamble of the Irish Constitution of the notion of human dignity is our gift to the world. Um, but that, that whole concept of human dignity is very much you know, a core part, underlying theme uh, of the rhetoric of rights in this area. Um, Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, provides that no one shall be subjected to torture or to cru cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. In particular, no one shall be subjected without his free consent to medical or scientific um, experimentation. And the prohibition on ill treatment and, and, and torture is one of the most developed areas within, within, the, within the, the, the jurisprudence of the, human right, the UN Human Rights Committee. And it's important to note that there isn't something that you can opt in or, or opt out of. There's no progressive realisation. It's never okay to torture. And um, the prohibition on torture is a rule of general international law and is broadly accepted as one of, it's a legal term, just cogens. And just cogens is a rule or principle in international law that is so fundamental that it binds all states. <laughs> So the approach of the Human Rights Committee in relation to torture and inhumane um, and degraded treatment and punishment is that they don't separate out the two actually. And we come, there's a different story when we look at the European Court of Human Rights, their approach to that. Um, they, don't, they haven't um, um, demarcated between those, th those two in their, in their jurisprudence. And if you look actually um, at, article, at actually Article 7 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political, Political Rights, what you'll see actually that it's very much linked um, to Article 10.1 as well. Um, I have a paper that I make available to you after the presentation where it, where it discusses that. Um, what's important then actually in terms of the UN Disability Convention is Article 15. So there is actually explicit provision um, for freedom from torture or cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment within the UN Disability Convention and that is provided for. And um, even though we have this pre, there's lots of different sources of international human rights law, the ones I referred to, and, and many others, which express, expressly you know, acknowledge the right to be free from um, torture or inhumane degrading treatment and, and punishment. Um, despite that, there was a failure within that mainstream human rights practice, as Janet Lord said, um, to ac account for violations of the torture prohibition against persons with disabilities. And if you're looking for a really good article that um, discusses the origins of um, Article 15 of the UN Disability Convention, Janet's article is the article to read. It's a really great article. Um, and if you look actually at the discourse around Article 15, what you'll see is that it's actually quite sparse in terms of adding anything new or fleshing out um, you know, the whole issue of freedom from, from torture or cr cruelly inhumane and degrading treatment as it applies to persons um, with disabilities. But I suppose what, what it does add is quite significant. 
And what it adds is actually that that whole paradigm shift in thinking in terms of the guiding principles in Article 3 of the Convention, that they are very much brought to bear in this area. So um, particularly in institutional settings that you have to have regard to those principles about you know, uh, independence, the recognition of legal capacity. Those things are really, really important. And that, I suppose, is really what the what the CRPD adds to this area, even though um, reading the actual text here, you wouldn't think it adds very much, really, in terms of um, what it says, actually, in the text of it. Um, if you read through, actually, the drafting history as well of Article 15, you'll see that um, it was actually quite, it was quite contentious in terms of, at the drafting stage, in terms of, you know, the whole issue of um, forced treatment uh, of people with mental health problems. Um, and that's really interesting. You read more about that in Janet's article. Um, what I should say as well is that Article 15 is very much related to other articles. So Article 12, which we've heard an awful lot about this week. Also Article 14, liberty rights, and particularly in the context of people who are detained because they're considered to pose a risk to themselves or, the, or others on the basis of a mental health problem. And the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2009 made a number of really challenging statements in relation to what Article 12 means. And one of the things, one of the things that they said was that Article 12 requires the abolition of the insanity defence and other similar defences in domestic law. So that's actually quite a challenging statement that state parties wouldn't have necessarily thought, signing up to the convention, that they would have had to get rid of something like the insanity defence. So it's quite controversial. Um, similarly, um, the interpretation of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights and subsequently the CRPD Committee, that Article 14 of the CRPD requires abolition of mental health laws as we know them, is quite controversial. So, you know, that, that's a, a point to bear in mind as well, in that while Article 15 um, is very much connected to these things, um, you know, there, there are difficulties in actually expanding out the right. Um, in terms then of a mandate in respect of um, torture, inhumane and degrading treatment, there's actually there's actually um, quite a lot. There's actually quite a lot in terms of different actors that are relevant here. Um, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities ha clearly have a mandate um, in relation in relation to this area. Um, particularly now that um, the committee has been set up and um, countries have ratified not only the convention but also the optional protocol and that there is scope for people who are persons with disabilities in institutions or elsewhere who are, have um, the right to be free from torture or inhumane degrading treatment or punishment um, has been violated they can take an individual complaint um, to the CRPD committee so that's, that's important to bear in mind. Um, what also is important to bear in mind is um, is that you have the, the convention against um, torture and you have the committee, um, the UN Committee on the Convention of Torture, which have an important role to play here as well. They're a body of independent experts that look at how state parties implement um, the, the, the CAT Convention, the Convention Against Torture. And um, they have a number of ways of working. They do it through the normal way, like the CRPD Committee. Um, they have um, a series, uh, they have a reporting system where um, state parties report and then um, the, the, the Commission responds to that in term, periodically uh, through concluding observations. So that's quite an important forum if there are um, violations of the rights of persons with disabilities in terms of uh, com coming within the scope of that convention. So that's important to bear in mind as well. Um, there is also the optional protocol to the CAT convention, and that's very important as well. Um, and that created the um, Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture. Um, and that convention, um, that optional protocol, came into force since 2006. And this is a really important thing in terms of engaging with it, because the subcommittee of the Provincial of Torture has a mandate to visit places um, where persons are detained, including persons with disabilities, at the national level. And they, can, um, they, they have a role in relation to um, you know, preventing torture. Um, and that applies to the institutional settings where persons with disabilities are often um, detained. Um, there also is a, a requirement um, under, under the optional protocol um, uh, at the national level to, to, to create independent national provincial mechanisms. So, for example, in Ireland, um, our national pr provincial mechanisms will be in relation to um, approved centres under our mental health legislation. So um, the Mental Health Commission has an inspectorate, the mental health um, inspector and his team go and, uh, go and inspect on a periodic and ongoing basis places of detention in accordance with the Mental Health Act 2001. But we actually... Sorry, I'm going too fast, okay. Um, Some of us have 
language as a second language. Yes. Yeah. Please. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, the other, the other, the other part, the, we, we, in Ireland we have deficits um, as well, so we, we don't have any inspection, we have no mandatory inspection of residential services for persons with intellectual disabilities, for example. And the Health Information and Quality Authority, which was set up to investigate um, you know, nursing homes, much in the same way as the Care and Quality Commission in, the, in England and Wales, um, they, they don't have a mandate in relation to residential services for persons with intellectual disabilities because the government haven't provided the money um, to ensure that the standards that have been come up, uh, come up, come up with by HICWA have been implemented. So we clearly will be falling foul in terms of that, but apparently the money is going to be made available in Ireland so that that national um, preventative mechanism um, will kick in. Then you also have um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Um, and this is actually a really, um, a really valuable um, mechanism within the international architecture in preventing um, torture or inhumane degrading treatment and abuse. And the special rapporteur actually isn't as constricted as the committee under CAT because um, um, the, the special rapporteur can act, um, can, can act in circumstances where there is an allegation of torture or inhumane degrading treatment or punishment, um, even where a country hasn't ratified the CAT Convention, so um, they can, it, it has a number of ways of, of operating. And actually, it, it's been really interesting to see the last two special rapporteurs in terms of taking, um, you know, mainstreaming, I suppose, um, uh, within their work, looking at the rights of persons with disabilities. And um, the link between reasonable accommodation and ill treatment was recognised in 2008 by the previous special rapporteur, who was at that time Manfred no no Novak, um, who actually observed that the lack of reasonable accommodation in detention facilities may increase the risk of exposure to neglect, violence and abuse, torture and ill treatment. And then, with much excitement then, the, the, the latest rapporteur in a report from February, Professor Juan Mendes, um, produced a very significant report that's really been heralded um, um, or warmly welcomed by a lot of um, DPOs and um, non-governmental organisations um, uh, in terms of his statements in relation to the CRPD uh, and mainstreaming that discourse within his own work. And what he said was that laws cannot provide doctors with the power to forcibly administer treatment. Importantly, he, he also said that restraint and seclusion should be immediately prohibited, and that includes the use of seclusion and restraint in, in psychiatric hospitals. And he also said that mental health services should be moved to be provided on a voluntary basis in the community. So very significant statements from the Special Rapporteur, who really has taken up the mantle um, in light of the UN um, CRPD. And I think that's, that, actually, that, that actually changed in terms of you know, those strong statements comes from DPOs, um, organisations like MDAC, who've been engaging with the Special Rapporteur in terms of um, making these types of statements. Uh, and then we have the European um, system then, which is what I'm really going to focus in, which I was asked to focus in, uh, focus on for the purposes um, of this presentation. And you have um, the Council of Europe. Are you all familiar with the Council of Europe? You've all heard of the Council of Europe? Yes, there's 47 member states, and the, um, the European Court of Human Rights is, is based within, within the Council of Europe. Um, and that's very important. So you have the, the European Convention on Human Rights, um, for, uh, which came out of World War, uh, following World War II, those human rights abuses, and really important in terms of protecting civil and political rights more so than economic, social, and cultural rights. It's very much based on civil and political rights. And then you also have um, this, this, this really important Convention on the Prohibition of Torture. And that's really important. Um, and that came out in the 80s, that convention, and it commenced in the, the late 1980s. And that provides for a series, for this committee, the European Committee on the Prevention of Torture. And they travel, um, they travel throughout Europe inspecting any place of detention. So places like prisons, police cells, but also psychiatric institutions and social care homes. So it's a really useful mechanism for investigating allegations of, um, you know, um, exploitation and abuse or um, torture, torture in particular, this mandates in torture. And really the purpose of the European Commission on the Prevention of Torture is to complement the work of the European Court of Human Rights in relation to Article 3. So that's really important. So as of last Monday, the, the, the European Committee on the Prevention of Torture made 342 um, state visits, um, 205 were periodic visits, so where they were scheduled visits, and the rest then, the 137 other ones, were ad hoc visits, so they weren't really announced. 
Um, and the way it works is actually it's a good way of ensuring if there are any problems or issues that states um, live up to their obligations under international human rights law. And the way it works is that um, if the state consents and they generally, more often than not, agree, the report that's, that's issued by the Committee in the Prevention of Torture is published and the response of the government to the report is published. So it's actually a very valuable mechanism um, for looking, at, uh, looking behind the walls of institutions, including psychiatric hospitals and social care, um, social care centres um, throughout Europe. Um, okay. Okay, so um, MDAC um, in 2012, they had a seminar um, with the Committee on the Prevention of Torture. And really, the purpose of that was that in 2012, um, what, uh, 2011, 2012, what the Committee on the Prevention of Torture were doing was they were updating their standards. And the interesting thing is that the Committee on the Prevention of Torture, they don't actually publish their, their very detailed standards, but they don't, they don't actually publish them, publish them, which is quite extraordinary when you think about it. They publish a kind of a, an abridged, shorter version on their, on their website, and they were updating their standards. And MDAC saw this as an opportunity to try and influence um, you know, the, 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 the way in which the committee, um, the committee did its work. And they were trying to embed within their new revised standards um, a lot of those principles that are contained in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons uh, with Disabilities. So MDEC had the seminar and they asked a number of people to come and present papers. Um, Jerry wasn't able to go, so I went and I wrote a paper on the need to embed the right to um, legal capacity and um, Article 19 of the CRPD within their standards. Um, and there were a number of other papers written, Anna Lawson wrote, for example, on um, the need um, for reasonable accommodation within institutional um, settings. So um, what was interesting was that um, the, the version that is published on the website did actually have some kind of tacit, vague, at the end of it, reference to the, to the move to the community, but they didn't go quite as far as MDAC were asking in terms of really embedding the principles from the UNCRPD um, within, um, within, their, um, within, their, within their standards that they use to affect <coughs> services. And... What's interesting if you look at um, the commentary around the CRPD is that there are a number of commentators that are saying that, well, look, the CRPD requires the Committee on the Prevention of Torture to be more robust in terms of looking at psychiatric hospitals, and um, they should develop standards, they should develop standards in relation to that, so that the Committee on the Prevention of Torture, for example, should have similar standards like, for example, the UN st standard, uh, minimum standard rules in relation to prisoners. So in terms of very specific standards about what an institution should be, you know, size of rooms, that sort of thing. And I think that's actually quite, we need to be very cautious about that. Um, because if you actually um, are requiring standards for institutions, I think you're giving very mixed messages to bodies like the Committee on the Prevention of Torture that, you know, I think it actually legitimises um, institutionalisation, which clearly um, is very questionable and is at odds with the philosophy and the rights contained in the UN Disability Convention. And Dragna on, on Wednesday, um, on yesterday, I think referred to that in terms of, um, you know, unintended consequences from the Committee on the Prevention of Torture's reports to Serbia. So I think you need to be um, very cautious in relation to that. And I think actually, if you look actually at the work of a lot of these bodies, the SBT, um, from CAT, you know, that, that body under um, uh, that, that optional protocol, that body that looks internationally. Um, really, I think there's a disconnection in terms of their standards with the philosophy in the UN Disability Convention. And um, there's a real need, I think, that th those inspection standards really, I think, um, engage with the convention. That's very important. And I think that connection in terms of what happens when people are stripped of their legal capacity, what happens in those set of circumstances hasn't really been met in those standards because actually the loss of your legal capacity brings you into um, these institutional settings and if you look at the WHO report um, from 2011 you'll see very clearly persons who are in institutions are more vulnerable to sexual violence and um, to inhumane degrading treatment and, and torture. So I think it's important that those standards that the Committee of the Prevention of Torture that they embed um, the general principles and also um, the right to live in the community within their standards. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is talk about some of the cases that have come before um, the European Court of Human Rights. So I'm not saying that Europe is really great when it comes to torture 
or inhumane degrading treatment in terms of prohibiting it. And actually, Europe has a really sordid history in relation to torture. Um, before, uh, so in, in 1215, um, Pope Innocent III, he was the Pope, the really influential Pope. If you look up here, there's actually, you can get an action figure for Pope Innocent III. He was a really important Pope. And what he did was he abolished um, trial by ordeal. And does anybody know what trial, trial by ordeal is? So basically, it means where um, there is a, somebody's accused, I accused Jared of stealing my cattle. But he did it at night time so nobody could see him do, nobody could see him do it. Um, and we need to resolve that because it's going to be, you know, a feud. And um, basically, um, Jared is arrested and Jared is asked to put his hand on a pot of water. This is what happened in Europe up to the 12th century. And God would intercede on Jared's behalf. Um, he wouldn't scald his hand um, <laughs> if he hadn't stolen my cattle, okay? Yeah, so this happened, this happened up until the 12th century, and then Pope Innocent III um, decided that this was unlawful because God was supposed to intercede on Jared's behalf to prove his innocence. And um, at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, what happened was that trial by ordeal and indeed trial by battle, those things went by the wayside. And you had something, you needed to replace it. So in England, you had trial by jury that was introduced, and in Europe, we had tr um, judicially administered torture. So that was the way of um, resolving these um, disputes from the 12th century onwards in mainland Europe. So you tortured people, but actually it was quite sophisticated. There, was, um, so there were safeguards in relation to it. You know, you corroborated the evidence. You made sure that what people confessed to, um, you know, corresponded with the facts. So we've actually quite a sordid history in Europe in relation to torture. It's very much part of our legal system, and it very much developed the rules of evidence, which are still in place. But that is no longer the case, and um, Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights um, provides a prohibition on torture. So no one shall be subjected to torture or to inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. That's what Article 3 says. And there's actually a really rich um, jurisprudence case law from the European Court of Human Rights um, in, relation, um, in relation to this. Now, what's really interesting about the European Court of Human Rights case law is that um, they have demarcated the parameters of torture and inhumane degrading treatment or punishment. So um, <clears throat> in their case law, they have, in their case law, they've taken a different approach to the um, Human Rights um, um, Commission in relation, uh, the UN Human Rights Committee, in relation to how they interpret this prohibition on torture. And this is illustrated by the case of, um, uh, of Ireland versus the United Kingdom. And this is a really interesting case, actually. It's a case um, coming out of Northern Ireland when internment without trial was introduced. And basically what happened was that, um, you know, there was terrorism and there was, there was a need to, to, to respond to terrorism. And uh, in the UK, how they responded to that was internment without trial. So that was um, deprivation of liberty without any procedural safeguards. And they introduced very, very questionable um, interrogation techniques. They were called the five techniques, and they involved disorientation, hooding suspects, subjection to noise, deprivation of sleep, and deprivation of food and drink. And this is the first case that one state took another state before an international human rights tribunal. And Ireland took the UK before the European Court of Human Rights, the European Commission, as it was called then alleging that there had been a violation of a number of rights under the UN Convention, including Article 3. And quite controversially, um, you know, in terms of the judgment, the European Court of Human Rights said, well, look, actually, um, these five techniques, they don't quite amount to torture, but what they do amount to, what they do amount to um, is actually inhumane degrading treatment and punishment. So um, that demarcation was brought. So the important point here, though, is that really whether or not there's a violation of the Convention, um, Article 3 of the European Convention, well, it really it is, it, it's a question of severity of, um, of the treatment um, suffered by the person. And that, um, uh, that, is, that is very important in relation to persons with disabilities, because clearly a person with a disability um, might be uh, put at greater disadvantage than a non-disabled person. Um, and if you look at the case law then that we look at, I think the, the core point to look at is that the courts really haven't teased out sufficiently um, the, the impact of a failure to provide reasonable accommodation to persons with disabilities. And that's, that's really important. And they haven't really come to terms with what the UN 
Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities says in terms of um, failure to provide reasonable accommodation will amount to discrimination in and of itself. So a failure to provide reasonable accommodation will be a, a violation in and of itself. Okay, um, you, with this case here of um, Stanov um, versus Bulgaria, it's a very important case. Um, it's been referred to a couple of times throughout the course of the summer school. And uh, it was a case that involved a man that was under guardianship in Bulgaria and he was deprived of his legal capacity and um, there were issues in relation to his right to liberty, in relation to fair procedures under Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights, but also there were um, issues around Article 3, which is the right to be free from torture and inhumane degrading um, treatment and punishment. And um, this is a quote from the facts of the case um, that, that was in the judgment. So what it said was, it appears that the food was insufficient and of poor quality. The building was inadequate, inadequately heated and in winter, the applicants had no had to sleep in his coat. He was unable to have a shower once a, he, was, he was able to have a shower once a week in an unhygienic and dilapidated bathroom. The toilets were in a, uh, were in a bad state, and access to them was dangerous. In addition, the home did not turn di, did not return clothes to the same people after they were washed, which was likely to arouse a feeling of inferiority um, in the residents. So actually. Um, under these set of circumstances, under the particular circumstances in which Mr. Stanov was d detained, the European Court of Human Rights said that actually in terms of the threshold, in terms of the level of suffering that he experienced, it meant that threshold for um, amounting not to torture but to a violation um, of the prohibition on inhumane and degrading treatment. So that's an important judgment. But the point I want to make about this case was, this case was decided last year, 2012, but the important thing to bear in mind is that this, this, this care home in which Mr. Stanov um, was detained actually had a CPT visit um, back in 2003. So the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture had visited that care home um, back in 2003. So this is the kind of bed you had. This is the bed that uh, the type of bed Mr. Stanov would have had to sleep in. He put his coat over and he slept there. So this building was from the 1920s. It housed uh, in the 1920s. Um, the uh, construction workers in, in a hydroelectric plant which was located near it, it was in a local area, it was in a very remote area, um, it was hard to get to uh, when it froze over, and that was all detailed in the CPT visit. And what the Committee of the Prevention of Torture said was that this place is not fit for purpose, you should close it down and build a new institution that has better facilities. And the point that I'm making is, okay, so this was decided before, th this, this, this report um, was decided before the UN Disability Convention um, you know, was concluded in New York, but actually the correct approach for the Committee of the Prevention of Torture, I would argue, would be that they should say, well, actually, under Article 19, you can't have institutional settings, you have to move towards um, community settings, and that it isn't a case of shutting down an institution and creating a nicer one, which would probably be a horrible one in time, um, but that you should, the, the standards should clearly say that you have to, um, you have to support people to live in the community and you have to rec recognise um, their legal capacity. So I think that, that's, that would be really important. And actually then, there might be no need for Mr Stanov to take his case um, if he was respected in that way. There are a number of other cases then that have been decided by the European Court of Human Rights that are, um, that are quite important. Um, Price versus the United Kingdom uh, is a very interesting case. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, it, familiar with it. This is a case that involved a woman who was committed to prison um, for, a contempt of, for a contempt of court. It wasn't a criminal matter, it was actually a debt matter and she, was, she wasn't cooperating and she was sent to jail. And it was late in the evening and she was sent to a prison cell and she couldn't get into the bed that was provided in the prison cell because it was too high up, uh, high up off the ground. And she, she, this lady in particular had no um, limbs, so she got cold very quickly and um, she needed to get into bed, she needed to get a good night's sleep and um, she didn't have an, a blanket and she kept complaining of the cold um, and she wasn't able to use the, 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 the facilities um, in the prison cell. So a doctor eventually came and gave her a blanket and then she, the following day she was transferred to a prison and okay, the, the, the environment was better in terms of the, there were wider doors, but she wasn't able to use the bathroom. Um, she, this was contested by the state, but she had to get assistance by male prison officers to help her to use the toilet, which she found very degrading. Um, and she suffered, uh, you know, the bed again wasn't, she wasn't able to get into the bed because it was too high, even though the cell was supposedly accessible. 
So she took the case um, to the European Court of Human Rights, alleging violation of her rights under Article 3, the right to be free from inhumane and degrading treatment and punishment. And the court said, well, actually, yes, um, you ought to recover. Um, yes, your, your rights have been violated. And they said, well, we don't believe that there was any deliberate, there was any deliberate attempt um, to actually um, inflict this, th th this humiliation upon you. Um, but they, they, they did say that the way in which things worked out, the way in which the environment wasn't accessible, amounted to a violation of your rights. Um, there are a number of other cases that are really important here as well. Um, Jacanis versus Lafia is an important case, and that considered, um, I suppose, the failure of making um, adjustments um, to a detainee with, uh, with a sensory disability. And this guy, he was deaf, and his father took the case because he actually died. And what had happened was that he wasn't able to speak, um, and he was deaf. And he sustained a head injury, and he was a, he, there was an altercation, and he was arrested by the police. And the police were aware that he had got a head injury, uh, but they sent away the ambulance, and they took him into custody. And the only way he could communicate was with a pen and paper. Um, and, and they took the pen and paper, they confiscated it, and he wasn't able to communicate with the guard, with the police officers, and he died um, a, number, uh, a number of days later. And... Uh, it, under, considering those circumstances, the, the, the court felt that there had been a violation of Article 2, the right to life. And what the European Court of Human Rights said was that the authorities decided to place and maintain in detention a person with disabilities. They should demonstrate special care in guaranteeing such conditions um, <clears throat> as correspond to the special needs resulting from that disability. So it isn't actually acknowledging a right, they're not articulating it in terms of a right to reasonable accommodation. But that it effectively is in terms of Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights in conjunction with other articles. You know, it is discrimination. Um, there is another case here then again, Keenan versus the United Kingdom. And this is a very tragic case, but one, of, one, one aspect of the case was rights under Article 3. Um, and you had a guy uh, who had a mental health problem who, um, who was, who, who in terms of being punished for failure to, to comply with um, prison staff, was placed in solitary confinement. And under those set of circumstances, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that this amounted to a violation of Article 3 of the ECHR. Um, there's another case here that I'd like to mention, which is Moselle versus France. Um, um, you know, it's a case from about 10 years ago, but this actually um, is, is a case um, that involved a prisoner who was diagnosed with leukemia, and he had to go to, um, he had to go to, he had to go from the prison he had to go from the prison um, to a treatment facility for, for chemotherapy on a regular basis. So he kept going, but the protocol dictated that he was chained um, and, and uh, at all stages in terms of in line with protocol. And um, the qu question facing the court whether, whether this actually treatment amounted to a violation of Article 3. And what the European Court of Human Rights said, yes, actually it does. It does um, amount to a violation um, of, of Article 3. Um, similar issues arose in this case um, of um, Farpus versus Latvia, and this case involved a man who was 84 years of age, and he was convicted of um, a serious criminal offence, um, and he was sentenced, and he began his prison sentence. But he was described in the evidence, if you read the, court, the, court, the judgment of the court, he was described as being virtually um, paralysed, and um, he had a number of other health issues, so... Um, he, during the daytime, when there was um, health officials, he's been dealt with within the health services within the prison. And what had happened was that um, was that he was very reliant on the health, people working in health services to you know for he, to meet his care and his health needs. But once those people weren't working, um, he de he depended on the kindness of fellow inmates to provide care to him. And um, the question before the court was whether this amounted to a violation of Article 3. And the European Court of Human Rights said, yes, well, actually, this does amount to a violation of the man's rights under Article 3. So what do these cases tell us then, um, I suppose, is the question um, we were, were trying to answer. And I think what it, what it tells me from reading them is that, um, the impact, there, that there is an impact, there's a quite clear impact when you fail to reasonably accommodate a person um, in the institutional setting, and that um, you know the built environment and policies and procedures can have a disproportionate impact on persons with disabilities.
and that it's really essential that there's flexibility in adapting uh, practices and policies and procedures to the particular circumstances of the persons involved. And in line with Article 8 of the CRPD, there's a real need for awareness raising and training of prison staff and that information um, has to be provided in an accessible format um, regarding, um, regarding, um, thanks Marie, <laughs> uh, regarding um, complaints. So if there's complaints mechanisms, information has to be provided in an accessible way. And what those cases also tell us that there are certain circumstances where people are being detained, particularly in prison settings, where um, the nature of their disability, the impact of imprisonment and deprivation of liberty will mean that they will need to be released from prison. And that really will have to be decided. Um, will have to be decided. Um, what I would say also is that reading those cases is very clear and very often we try to be very optimistic when we read cases that are coming out of the European, Courts, the European Court of Human Rights over the last number of years where they have referred to the, European, to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. In particular, the Glore case um, you know, was very positive in terms of um, what the European Court of Human Rights said in terms of our evolving understanding of disability. But that, I, I think, hasn't really translated in, in the cases. And I think Camilla was talking about it yesterday in relation to the Stanov case, in relation to Article 8, the right to private and family life under the European Convention of Human Rights. And that hasn't happened. And it's very clear, I think, as well, that you know, um, the paradigm shift in thinking around legal capacity hasn't happened. Um, and it's, it's very, it's, it, I think what it behoves us in terms of any litigation that is coming out, uh, that's coming before the courts, that you continue to make those arguments around the UN Disability Convention and um, to develop those rights like Article 3 in line with the general principles outlined in the CRPD. So I'll conclude then, and we'll have time for questions and answers. Um, there is, I suppose, the, the, thing to, the thing to bear in mind is that there is a wealth of international human rights law dealing with the right to be free from torture and inhumane degrading treatment and punishment. In addition, there is a number of monitoring bodies at the national, regional and international level that have a mandate in investigating and preventing torture and inhumane, inhumane degrading treatment and punishment. And even though we had this developed, you know, this developed framework, there really is, I think, an opportunity to embed the principles within the CRPD um, within that. And I think that would be very beneficial in terms of developing the jurisprudence and the approach of the European Court of Human Rights, but also in terms of these monitoring bodies that we all engage with them and we try to get them to reorientate their standards in relation to how they inspect facilities. Um, I think what's very important as well is that where you don't have disability-specific um, Committees. So, for example, if you look at the subcommittee of the Provincial Torture under CAT, you'll see that the vast majority of places that they inspect are actually um, they're places where um, where you would they would traditionally have inspected. So, for example, prisons, um, you know, police custody cells, perhaps psychi psychiatric hospitals to a lesser extent, and social care rooms they don't really go to. So, I think there's a real need to put pressure on the um, on, on bodies like the Committee of the Prevention of Torture and on the Subcommittee, the Subcommittee of the Prevention of Torture under CAT to actually go to psychiatric hospitals and to go to social, um, social care homes. And I think what's really important as part of that is that there has to be sufficient expertise within the, committee, within the committees. And I think that's really important as well, that you have persons with disabilities on the inspection teams, because persons with disabilities are going to be more comfortable with going to psychiatric hospitals. They can push the committee to visit more psychiatric hospitals, more social care homes. And I think in some of the literature that's coming out already, particularly on the subcommittee in the provincial torture, it's very clear that they aren't visiting, they're, they're more comfortable visiting prisons and um, prisons and um, police, police, police um, custody cells, for example. So I think it's really important that you not only um, have, um, that they investigate psychiatric hospitals, but also that they have the expertise and the whole philosophy within the UN Disability Convention around having nothing about us without us, that there is um, sufficient representation of persons with disabilities within these mainstream fr frameworks for, in for investigation and prevention. So civil society is really important there, and the connection hasn't been sufficiently or meaningfully teased out within judgments within the CHR, within the ECHR, around reasonable accommodation and ill-treatment and torture. So there's a need to actually argue um, the principles within the CRPD and develop the, um, the jurisprudence around that. So I'll stop talking and I'll open up for questions. And I'm very much aware that there are people much more expert than I am here who have worked in this area. So um, I'd be very interested to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.